Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about anti-colonial struggles in Asia against American imperialism in the first half of the 20th century. Specifically, but not exclusively, we'll look at the Philippines' war for independence and how imperial Japan was seen and used as a counter to the United States. It's a fascinating story that would have major repercussions for Asians Asians living in the United States. My guest for this conversation is Moon Ho Jung. Moon Ho Jung is a professor of history at the University of Washington, and he's the author of such books as Coolies and Cane, Race, Labor, and Sugar in the Age of Emancipation. His latest book that we will be in conversation about is called Menace to Empire, Anti-Colonial Solidarities in the Trans-Pacific. Moon Ho Jung, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. All right. Thank you for having me. Tell me why you begin the story with the Spanish-American War of 1898. Well, you know, I, I, I begin the introduction by reminding everybody or any, anybody who picked up the book, who picks up the book, that the United States was, uh, has always been, continues to be an empire, um, an empire rooted in white supremacy. And, and, you know, there have been movements against the U.S. empire, against empire. Um, and, and the book is really about movements against the U.S. empire across the Pacific. So I begin in the Philippines because it was, you know, Filipinos had been waging a revolution against the Spanish empire um, really in 1896, um, and then the U.S. Empire uh, and the Spanish Empire go to war in 1898. And, you know, Theodore Roosevelt, who was the U.S. Um, Assistant Secretary of the Navy at the time, decided to send uh, a, a, a naval fleet to Manila. So the Spanish-American War really was fought in the Philippines as much as in, you know, in Cuba and the Caribbean. Um, and, and, and Really, the the main argument of the book is about how the U.S. Empire constructed a a, a security state, a, a national security state, to uh, to protect its claims uh, in the Philippines and 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 across the Pacific. Was Spain an imperial power in the Philippines and in the region, and, and played a role in Asia the way the United States would afterwards after the Spanish American War? Well, you know, Magellan um, was the first Spanish uh, to claim the Philippines on behalf of the Spanish crown. And, and so Spain claimed the Philippines as a colony for 400 years. It's a long time. It if you think time. about it, it's much older than the United States even. Yeah. So the colonization of you know places like Mexico and the Philippines happened at the same time. The United States at first would side with the people struggling for independence in the Philippines against Spain. Well, okay, well, Filipino revolutionaries thought the you know that Americans, the United States, could be an ally in their struggle against uh, the Spanish, um, and you know uh, the Spanish forces were reeling, and the Spanish decide that they would rather surrender to the United States than to Filipino revolutionaries. And so, you know, the Spanish-American War was relatively short. It, was, it lasted about four months. And at the end of that war in December of 1898, the United States agreed with Spain to purchase the Philippines for $20 million. Now, U.S. is making claims over the Philippines, but Filipinos don't want another colonial master um, and so in 1899, um, the Philippine-American War erupts. And this is a bloody war. It lasts a long time, officially until 1902. But really, the fighting continues for at least another decade. Tell, tell and me it's a really, really bloody war. Um, and it's a war that, unfortunately, very few Americans know about. But, you know, the lower range of the estimates of the number of Filipinos killed is 250,000 people. That is a lot of people. And that's the lower end of the range. Yeah, I was going to say most people have heard of the Americans, the, the Spanish-American War. Not many people have heard of the Philippine-American War. 
And so, you know, Theodore Roosevelt claims the war ends on July 4th, 1902, but, but really these are imperial claims, right? The United States is claiming sovereignty over the Philippines, but Filipinos continue to resist U.S. colonial rule. And, 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 and so the book begins in the Philippines because that's really where this um, security state as we know it, I argue, really begins to take root and proliferate. And by that, I mean not only outright war, but a system of intelligence, surveillance, and, um, and, and eventually the immigration system would also become part of that security state. So you see this as the beginning of that, something that we'd see throughout the rest of the, the 20th century and even, even to today? That, that is my argument. And, you know, as I pointed out, you know, earlier, the, the United States was and continues to be an empire. So it's not as if that, that, that security state wasn't there. But I think the scale, the size uh, of that security state really begins to expand dramatically over the first three decades of the 20th century. What more can you tell me about the Philippine American War? How, how was it fought from from both sides? Well, it, it was a very, um, so um, Aguinaldo and, and, and people who had been waging war against the Spanish, they decide to take up arms against the U.S. empire. Um, and, you know, eventually they, they take up guerrilla warfare. And in response, uh, the U.S. military takes on draconian measures. Um, they called it reconcentration. That is, um, they would order uh, the civilian population to gather in particular places. And if you were outside of those particular zones, um, you, you could be killed. Um, and, and so it was a bloody war. A lot of the military tactics that um, that would become notorious, like in places like Vietnam, much later, really are practiced initially in the Philippines. Talk to me about sedition. And it, what is it, 1901, there would be the Sedition Act in the Philippines? Yeah, so the U.S. Philippine Commission, which is in you know charge of uh, of the Philippines, of governing the Philippines, um, so it's really a colonial regime, they decree a measure called the Sedition Act. And it's basically anybody um, expressing any kind of anti-colonial uh, thought, um, even just by writing anti-colonial thoughts, a any expression of the Philippines um, being separated from the United States, that was defined as sedition. And what would the effects of, of that be, of that law? Well, you know, anybody that would question U.S. colonial authority in the Philippines could be arrested for sedition. Many organizations that, um, like labor organizations that, that would or try to organize workers would be charged with sedition. So, so really any kind of political activity that interrogated, that questioned U.S. authority, they could be criminalized as, as engaging in sedition. I think you said that the Philippine-American War would come to an end in 1901, though I think you also said that it would actually continue for another, ten, another decade or so. But what was significant about 1901 and why do others consider that to be the end of that war? Well, the U.S. government claims that it ends in uh, 1902. 1902. Um, but but really, th th there's popular sentiment against U.S. colonial rule. Um, and, and so Theodore Roosevelt claims that the war is over in 1902. But what's really happening on the ground is, you know, there is there's popular sentiment movement against the U.S. empire. Um, and so, you know, I begin the story uh, 
early in the book about a wave of labor strikes just one month before that declaration, the U.S. declaration of the end of the war. There's a huge wave of labor strikes in the Philippines. And, and so you can really get a sense of how tenuous um, U.S. claims over the Philippines really are. Tell me about Isabello de los Reyes. Who was he? So De Los Reyes was a journalist, um, and he had been writing editorials against the Spanish Empire. And in 1897, he was arrested um, by the Spanish, and he was deported from the Philippines to Barcelona. Now, Barcelona, in, in Barcelona, there was a prison. It was notorious at the time for its torture chambers. And it, it's there that he becomes introduced to anarchism um, by fellow prisoners. And, and, and so he is released from prison in 1898. And, um, and he decides to publish a, another newspaper in Spain. He calls it the Philippines before Europe. And, and the motto that, that he inscribes onto that newspaper is against North America, no against imperialism until death. And so he, he takes up an anti-colonial position to, in, in Spain. And in 1901, uh, during the height of the Philippine-American War, he decides to go back to the Philippines to try to, um, you know, put, put, put into practice what he learned in Barcelona about anarchism, about organizing workers. And, and so the, the massive wave of strikes that I just talked about in 1902 really was, um, I wouldn't say organized, but, but, but really the impetus behind it was Isabella de los Reyes and his efforts to organize a labor federation, a labor movement in the Philippines. So, so this is interesting, the, the anarchism aspect of it. And, and was it something that was popular in the Philippines? I wouldn't say it was widely popular, but definitely you can see uh, aspects of anarchism. And, and I think we tend to forget um, how influential anarchism was in, in, you know, radical circles, especially at the turn of the 20th century. And, you know, President McKinley, who, who was, you know, in the White House um, during the Philippine-American War, at, the, at least the beginning of it, um, he was assassinated by a self-identified anarchist, right? Um, and, and, and so, and, and there are political assassinations, you know, across Europe around the same time period. And so anarchism, which really um, competed with communism, right, and, uh, as a critique of communism, um, really is, becomes a, a critical element of anti-colonial movements and anti-colonial thought. That's interesting. And of course, it's in the early 20th century where we have anarchist movements in the United States as well. Do you see a connection between the anarchist movement in the early 20th century in the United States and what we've talked about in the Philippines and the Philippine War for Independence? I mean, there, there are definite connections. So Leon Chokosh, uh, who was who assassinated McKinley, um, he, I mean, you can, he talked about the crimes committed by the U.S. government in the Philippines. And that was one of the reasons why he felt that he had to, um, to put a stop to McKinley. Um, oh, that's interesting. That, that's one connection. Um, but also, you know, a lot of um, Asians who would come to live in the United States, especially along the Pacific coast, um, people like Hardayal that I write about in a different chapter, um, they would take up anarchism, they would take up different, different revolutionary ideas, and they would be marked as anarchists, right? So after McKinley's assassination, the U.S. government passed what's come to be known as the Anarchist Exclusion Act, forbidding anybody who believed in anarchism from entering the United States, from becoming a U.S. citizen. Right? And so a lot of Asian uh, activists, um, anti-colonial activists, would be criminalized as 
anarchists. And that was that was in the immigration laws. Right. Yeah. Right. And they're specifically thinking, maybe not exclusively, but what was going on in the Philippines was was a major component of that. Well, really, any kind of movement against empire. Um, so people like Hart Ayal, they were organizing against the British Empire, but the U.S. government interpreted that anti-colonial movement as a threat to the U.S. interests um, in the Philippines. In in really, the United States was really committed to keeping the racial and colonial order of the world. So there's a strong link. For, forgive me for for keeping going here, but I, I think this is important. Yeah. Uh, there's a strong link between anarchism, or at least what's proclaimed to be, or ac even accused of being anarchism and anti-colonial efforts. Because of course, I I, I guess it's not as um, uh, I don't know politically correct or so to say this is the anti-colonial uh, you know uh, sedition act or something like that. It would be much more easier to, to, to claim it was anarchism. Yeah, and, and really, you know, I think the term sedition is critical there, right? It's a crime against the nation, but it's really fundamentally, if you, especially if you look at the, you know, the time period that I'm looking at, it's really about securing empire, right? So you label somebody as seditious, un-American, anti-American, um, if they are struggling, if they're mobilizing against empire, against white supremacy. Is the Philippines the center of American power in Asia, in Eastern Asia specifically? Um, yeah, in the time period that I'm looking at, yeah, I mean, that that is, a, that is formally um, claimed by the United States. And I think people also tend to forget that the United States ruled over the Philippines from 1898 until 1946. Right? Uh, that's a long time period. I mean, um, the United States continues to have a lot of authority over the Philippines, but, but you know, outright formal um, colonial rule over the Philippines lasted the first half of the 20th century. Another fascinating aspect about your book is Japan during this period of time. Japan is an imperial power itself, and mm -hmm. and it is serving in, in a way, I mean, it's just an interesting dynamic that's going on in, in Asia between the United States and Japan. And, uh, you know, when we think of the United States and Japan, we th especially in the lead up to the World War II, we think of the attack on Pearl Harbor, then obviously we think about the dropping of the atomic bombs on on Nagasaki and uh, Hiroshima, but but th there's actually a past there that I think most people don't know about that spans the previous fifty years. Of, of I, w w could we say a struggle between Japan and the United States in the region? Yeah, and, and a lot of it is projected, I think, imagined by U.S. officials as a way to justify its colonial presence in places like the Philippines. Uh, so really, you know, um, you have the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905, where Japanese forces, uh, you know, win over, over, uh, over Russia, uh, the Russian Empire, and uh, and you know, Japan is an is an empire. It's a rising empire, um, but at the same time, a lot of colonized peoples around the world, communities of color around the world, um, they they begin to romanticize Japan as a new possibility. Right? That that here is an empire fighting against white supremacy. So you know. Um, even black radicals like W.E.B. Du Bois, they begin to think of Japan, you know, a, a, as a guiding force, um, potentially leading uh, the darker peoples of the world um, against empire. Um, and, and, you know, people in the Philippines exploit that rhetoric. Some of them look to Japan, at, you know, um, perhaps as leading Asia against um, against the West. But here's the thing, um, formally through government channels, um, you know, Japan and the United States are working together. So in 1905, they, they sign an agreement where the United States uh, agrees to honor Japan's claims over Korea. Uh, 
And in return, Japan agrees to honor U.S. claims over the Philippines. So formally, they are in complete al alignment. They are both about empire. Now, behind the scenes, uh, President Theodore Roosevelt begins to wonder if Japan has larger ambitions um, to take over the Philippines, to take over Asia. And so really it's beginning, you know, around 1906, 1907, that the U.S. military begins to uh, devise uh, war plans against Japan in particular. And so it becomes a self-feeding cycle where, you know, any kind of movement against the U.S. empire somehow comes to be linked with Imperial Japan. And so Filipino revolutionaries talk about how, you know, if there's a war between the United States and Japan, um, you know, that will be the moment that they can strike against the U.S. empire. This is Letters and Politics. We are in conversation with Moon Ho Jung, professor of history at the University of Washington. And we're in conversation about his book, Menace to Empire, Anti-Colonial Solidarities and the Trans-Pacific. This, this dynamic would also lead both to anti-Asian racism here in the United States in the first half of the 20th century. You obviously see it in the second half of the 19th century with the, Asian, uh, with the Chinese Exclusion Act and these kind of things. But there, but there is this drive in the early 20th century, and you see it even in literature. I, th I think of um, Jack London was somebody who's, who's guilty uh, of this, and and you, and you also see it uh, with with laws. You were already sort of talking about it earlier concerning immigration. T tell me about what's happening in East Asia and how this is affecting uh, lives for Asians in the United States. Well, you know, I think the idea of national security is really a 20th century idea. But, you know, what I was really surprised by was I went back and looked at the, the court case, the Supreme Court case around Chinese exclusion. So the Ch Chinese workers are excluded from the United States um, beginning in 1882. And, 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 and Chinese filed lawsuits against that law. Um, and in 1889, the U.S. Supreme Court came down with a decision justifying Chinese exclusion. And, and really what astonished me was the, the defense of Chinese exclusion was really pivoted around this idea of security. Um, the Supreme Court said that the United States government could pass laws targeting particular populations if it wanted to, if it deemed that population to be a threat to its security, right? So it, it didn't have to be a population that the United States was at war with. It could be simply people moving to the United States. But if the U.S. government deemed that as a threat to its security, then it could um, pass laws prohibiting their uh, entry into the United States. And so really the way I look at immigration law is it, it becomes a way to silence, um, repress uh, radical ideas, anti-colonial movements, and it becomes a mechanism through which a lot of Asian radicals in particular um, come to be targeted by the U.S. government, um, come to be uh, defined as seditious. And some of them, many of them would be deported from the United States on those grounds. Well, would this also include European radicals or do you think it was specifically for Asian radicals? Well, it would definitely include European radicals. Um, but, you know, one, uh, the original question behind this book project was, you know, when, when I started teaching courses in U.S. history, like we all kind of know that U.S. immigration laws targeted Asians and, and, and radicals, um, especially over the first three decades of the 20th century, but, but we tend to put them into separate categories, right? <clears throat> and so my, my, my hunch was that there had to be some kind of a connection, right? And, and I think we see that through um, the application of immigration laws against, you know, Gadar activists. So it was Gadar, 
the Ghadar movement was a revolutionary movement uh, uh, organized by South Asians living in the United States, um, challenging the British Empire. Um, um, they were really radical in terms of rhetoric, some of the strategies that they that they began to embrace. Um, and, and they really suffered under the immigration system as a result. Speaking of the Ghadar movement, your your prologue tells the story of Dada Amir Haider Khan, which is really a riveting story his in itself. T tell me yeah. about Dada Amir Haider Khan. Yeah, no, he his, his story is pretty amazing. So he grew up in in British occupied Punjab. Uh, so the British uh, claimed sovereignty over uh, Punjab. And he be, he decided to run away from home, um, and he worked, you know, on, on many ships, on British ships, and he grew to really, he grew enraged over the British Empire, um, and he started organizing against the British Empire. Um, he's sailing all over the world, right? He's working on these merchant vessels. And in 1918, he begins to consider New York City his home base. Um, and at that time, he decides, you know, I'm going to apply to become a U.S. citizen, a naturalized U.S. citizen, um, because I, I, you know, I have no loyalty to the British, right? He gets naturalized uh, he gets that naturalized citizenship and you know he's one of may, may dozens of south asians who are able to become u.s citizens through naturalization most asians were barred from from becoming naturalized citizens um and he begins to think that the united states is, is a refuge of sorts where you know he could express his anti-colonial thoughts and then he begins to really become politicized in the United States. He begins to see what's happening in the South with Jim Crow segregation. Um, and then he moves to Detroit. And, um, and there he becomes really radicalized. He, he, he observes how Black communities in Detroit are mobilizing. Um, he becomes uh, introduced to Marxism in Detroit. And through local communist channels, um, he gets an opportunity to, to go to Moscow um, to, to really receive a revolutionary education in Moscow at, at, at the KUTV. Um, that was the, the abbreviation. It's the Communist University of the, for the Toilers of the East. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it's where peoples from all over the world across the Soviet Union, but all over the world come to Moscow to receive a, a revolutionary education. And then they were supposed to go back home and then, you know, help to organize a revolutionary movement. Um, and so Khan ends up in Moscow and he just cannot believe what he is seeing. Like he, he's talking about the heterogeneity of the population at the university. He's talking about how, um, you know, he's taking a lot of courses in Marxism at, at, at KUTV. Um, and then at the end of his formal education in Moscow, he has to decide. And, you know, when he's in Moscow, he's also there with black radicals from the United States who are also in Moscow at the same university. Um, and so at the end of uh, uh, his formal education in Moscow, he has to decide, am I going to go back to India or am I going to go back to the United States? And he decides to go back to, to India. Um, and, you know, he's hunted down by the British, the British um, system of intelligence and surveillance um, for his seditious activities against the British Empire. Um, and, you know, when when India and Pakistan are formed in 1947, um, he begins to be arrested by um, Pakistani officials. And in 1954, the U.S. government applied pressure uh, to pa Pakistani authorities to ban the Communist Party in Pakistan. And so he begins to face, you know, different cycles of imprisonment, arrest, um, and, you know, toward after, at that moment, he begins to wonder, like, I've always been an enemy of 
the British Empire. But I don't understand why these Pakistani officials are arresting me, are are are, are deeming me a criminal. Um, and, and and so his story really helps to tie together, you know, the, the story of the 20th century, which is really about the Red Scare, about anti-communism. And, and it's a reminder of how much communism was tied to anti-colonial movements, you know, really beginning in, especially in the 1920s. Yeah, this is interesting. We talked about the role of anarchism earlier, a little bit later, communism would play an important role. The The Russian Revolution, and Russia is an interesting player in the story that you tell, because we start with the Russia losing to Japan in, in the early 19th century, and what a monumental moment this would be for, for, for many people across the world. Uh, but after the Russian Revolution, Russia would become, I don't know, would it be appropriate, say, an ally to anti-colonial efforts in Asia? Oh, yeah, I, I would say so. Yeah. And I think that's an important part of the history that we we also tend to forget, right, is that the communist movement was a lot of things to different peoples. Um, but really, the communist movement took a very public vocal stand against colonialism and racism. And that is why so many people gravitated to the movement. Right. Um, and, and so Lenin starts talking about colonialism um, and, and, and when he established the you know, reestablished the, the Communist International or the Third International, and, and, you know, beginning in 1920, they begin producing, publicizing, publishing what they call the theses, you know, and the national and colonial question. And they really are trying to provide um, active support to anti-colonial movements around the world. What was Lenin talking about racism specifically, along with colonial? I think that would come a little bit later. So he, uh, Lenin dies in 1924, um, uh, it, it, and you know the the theses on the national and colonial question that 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 he wrote the first draft of does talk about racism to an extent, but it's really a question of colonialism. Um, but by, you know, by the second half of the 1920s, um, the, the communist, the third international also, um, you know, uh, puts together this idea of the black belt of the United States forming a separate nation. Right. So it, it, it definitely takes an active, stand against um, both colonialism and white supremacy, right? We get in the United States the Sedition Act, I believe, of, of 1918, oftentimes seen to be related to World War I, people opposing World War I. I think it was under the Sedition Act of 1918 that Eugene Victor Debs would serve time in jail, uh, a long time in jail, even run from president for president from a jail cell. Right. Is is this act and in, in its passage and its use also related to U.S. concerns over anti-colonial movements? Yeah, and you know the the Ghadar activists would be charged, um, you know, with uh, it was called the violating U.S. neutrality laws um, during World War One. Um, it was called the Hindu conspiracy trial um, that happened in San Francisco. So the laws that we've been talking about, like the 1903 Anarchist Exclusion Act, I mean, that, those are the, that is the foundation to different immigration laws, including um, laws passed in 1917, 1918, during the height of World War I. Right? And, and so really, people mobilizing against empire and i would say you know in in the book that i i write about mostly at the Ghadar movement becoming targets of um of immigration law um targeting anarchists they would be labeled anarchists um but really it, it's anybody that is questioning um racism and colonialism who are targeted the hindu conspiracy trial in san francisco i have to ask you about that <laughs> 
So, you know, by the time that they are charged with violating U.S. neutrality laws, um, the United States is fighting alongside the British. Um, so they are at war when they are charged um, in 1917, I believe. Um, and, and so, you know, the Ghadar activists have been mobilizing against the British Empire Um they're formally organized before World War I. Um, but then some of them begin to work with Germany because they begin to think, okay, the British are occupied with fighting Germany and Europe. Now is our moment. Now is our moment to strike a rebellion, a revolution in India. So, you know, thousands of Qadar activists from the United, United States decide to go back to India to try to foment a, a revolution against the British Empire during World War I. It's at that time that the British government really began to apply pressure on the U.S. government. you got to put a stop to that movement. And so the U.S. government complies. Um, they had been collecting information on the Ghadar movement for years um, in alliance with the British, and then they begin to prosecute them um, during World War I. And so it's come to be known as the Hindu conspiracy trial, but it's really a, a, a trial where, you know, it, it costs a lot of money. Um, I, I believe the U.S. government spent something like $500,000, and I forget how much the British spent, but it was in the millions of dollars. And really, it's an effort by the British and the U.S. governments who are supposedly fighting for democracy, right, during World War I. Um, they want to clamp down on these radical movements um, that are challenging their empires. Is the Ghadar movement specifically active in San Francisco or California since the trial happened in San Francisco? Yeah, it was, um, you know, there's some South Asian intellectuals that, that, take, that find home in, in California in particular, but it's the thousands of migrant workers who really support that movement because and and they get involved in part because they 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 recognize the hostility um the racism that they face uh from u.s immigration authorities and so they begin to make connections between the u.s empire and the british empire um, and that, you know, their status within the British Empire is being replicated in how they are being treated in the United States. I want to move us through the, the 20th century here and about World War II. Let me, let me ask you about World, World War II. Oftentimes, I think Americans still don't quite understand why Japan had bombed Pearl Harbor does, does this story that you tell and sort of the imperial games between both the United States and Japan at all explain what would happen to Pearl Harbor in 1941? You know, it, it's definitely not a focus of the book, but I think, I think it tells an aspect of the story um, because I think we need to remember that World War II was in many sense an inter-imperial war. Right. Um, and so most people don't, I, 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 well, I don't think, um, I don't mean to underestimate the American people, but I think most Americans don't remember that, um, you know, Japanese forces attacked Hawaii and at the same time attacked the Philippines, attacked, you know, what the French claimed as Indochina at the same time. Right. So it, it's definitely an inter-imperial war. Um, and it's it, 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 and so I think that's an important context. I think the imaginings of U.S. officials over the first half of the 20th century um, that cast anybody that was against the U.S. empire had to be supporting Japan. Right. That that was the projection made by U.S. authorities. And, and so in places like Hawaii, where, you know, there are the, the Japanese are the majority of the population, definitely majority of the plantation labor force. When they begin to go out on strike, U.S. Mil military authorities begin to take note. 
they begin to uh, interpret a labor strike, right, on the plantations as an expression of Japanese solidarity, um, an expression of Japanese imperial, imperial designs in Hawaii. And, you know, all these reports emerging out of the Philippines that Filipino revolutionaries might work with Japan, right, with the Japanese government, those ideas get transferred to Hawaii. And so after there's a huge labor strike in 1909 organized by Japanese workers. Um, after that strike, uh, these white planners begin to recruit Filipino workers en masse to Hawaii. And then when Japanese and Filipino workers go out on strike in 1920, right, um, U.S. authorities begin to imagine, oh, it's that pan-Asian conspiracy that we had witnessed in the Philippines. Now it's taking root in the Philippines, right? And so this imagining of Imperial Japan leading a movement, a pan-Asian movement against the U.S. empire, I think is really the narrative of U.S. national security in and across the Pacific. And, and that would have devastating consequence, consequences for, you know, the, the Japanese living in Hawaii, living in California, living on the West Coast. For anti-colonial activists in Asia, maybe specifically Japan, but, but other places too, you, you, you could clarify for me, um, is the view of Japan as being a counterweight to U.S. imperialism complicated? And I ask that because Japan itself, as we say, is an imperial power itself. Um, it has also committed its own atrocities. I think of Nanking mm -hmm. in China, Korea as well. I mean, these countries, there's still tension between these countries today because of, because of this history. Um, are, is, it, is, is it a complicated situation for anti-colonial activists to see Japan, also an imperial power, as a counterweight to U.S. power? Yeah, no, and I, I would say it's, it, it's complicated, it's contradictory, right? Because I think um, the, the Japanese, uh, and I think people imagined a lot of anti-colonial activists romanticized Japan as a potential leader against um, against the West, but in reality, uh, Japan was an empire. It was, its government passed anti-communist, anti-radical measures to, to suppress um, any kind of anti-colonial movement against Japan, right? So that's happening on the ground. And so I think we need to distinguish between, you know, these imaginings of what Japan might be or could be and Japan as a reality, as an empire, right? And, and, but what begins to happen, and this is go, goes back to your question about World War II, is, you know, U.S. authorities want to um, really dichotomize the world. Either you are for Japan or you are for the United States, right? And, and that is with the us binary. or against us. Yeah. <laughs> and really, that's the binary that people are stuck in and they have to choose, right? And, and that applies to Japanese Americans, you know, uh, incarcerated in U.S. concentration camps. Are you for Japan or are you for the United States, right? So you're supposed to choose your loyalty. And, you know, what I point out at the end of my book is that was never the contradiction, right? The United States or Japan. Because in my mind, they were both for empire, right? Really, the fundamental contradiction was between empire and democracy, right? And whether you cho chose Japan or the United States, you were um, for empire, right? And, and so I think the deeper struggle is to recognize that contradiction and to organize against it, right? That Because... It, in my mind, empire and, and democracy cannot coexist. Uh, it just reminds me, and I think something that we, we see with anti-colonial, anti-imperial politics going back from this area, this era that you begin of always this, this question of, is the enemy of my enemy my friend? Mm 
And, right. And it seems like right. this question is very much alive with Japan as well as an imperial power. Yeah. And, and, and really, you know, people, many people had to choose sides at that particular moment, but I think it was short-sighted in many respects, right? Um, you know, so one person that I write about in, in, at the very end of my book is Carl Yoneda, um, a, a Japanese-American communist. He was very much against um, Imperial Japan. He himself was, had family in Japan, but he was against the Japanese empire. Um, and he had been under surveillance by the U.S. government for his, you know, subversive red activities as a communist. Uh, but once Pearl Harbor happens, he he really embraces um, this fight against fascism above anything else. And he begins to, you know, serve as an informant against other Japanese for being potentially pro-Japanese to the U.S. government, even though the U.S. government is mon monitoring his activities in a concentration camp for subversive activities. Right. It's a. It's a it's a fascinating, bizarre story, but he really proclaims himself as, you know, as um, as in support of the United States during World War Two, even, at, you know, at a time when um, his, his family, his people, Japanese Americans are in concentration camps placed there by the U.S. government. Right. Um, and, and so. Going back to what I pointed out earlier, really, it was not between the United States and Japan, right? It was not the equation that the U.S. government insisted, which was you are if, if you are for for Japan, then you are against the United States, right? Um, really, I think the 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 story that the lesson from Yoneda's story is that we need to be critical. We need to be Try, we need to recognize the broader history. We need to think deeper and really think about, you know, the, the ongoing history of empire and how we can think, organize against it. Japan was certainly allied with fascist states of Italy and Germany in World War yep. II. Yep. But, but Japan was fascist itself? Japanese government. Um, yeah, I think there were definitely fascist components. Yeah. In the same way that you would find in Germany and, and Italy? Um, definitely in terms of its co colonial policies. Um, and I think we tend to forget that Germany was a colonial power, right? And, and had colonial aspirations in the Pacific and in Africa, right? And so I think that's why it's helpful to think about World War II as an inter-imperial war right so much more still to talk about including korea <laughs> vietnam you write about ho chi minh in your book we have what we call on radio the tyranny of the clock which is now uh towards its <laughs> end but uh I, I hope you'll return and and talk to us more about these things in the future but moon ho jung i've enjoyed our conversation very much today and i thank you all right well thank you very much for your interest Moon Ho Jung has been our guest. Again, he's a professor of history at the University of Washington. He has joined us for a conversation about his book, Menace to Empire, Anti-Colonial Solidarities and the Trans-Pacific.